We have been in a series, started last week, church, John chapter 3, titled Two Paths. And we're actually in the book of John chapter 3. If you would like a Bible, we've got some in the back. You can grab one. The text will also be on the screen, or you can pull it up on your device. John chapter 3. If you missed last week, you can go online and watch that, give you the full context of what we're talking about. It's actually part two of Nick at Night. Nick being Nicodemus. Nicodemus meets Jesus at night. It's actually, there's a little, little twist today, so stay with me. It's not the night that you're thinking of. Nicodemus at night, John chapter 3. And as we go through this, we're looking at the story of two characters in John 3, and then next week we'll look at Sam at noon. So you should be able to remember this series, Nick at night and Sam at noon. Look at Sam next week, all right? But we're talking about your story. Everyone in the room has a story, a story that God's doing in your life. And to, to take a look at this, visually, there's a place, this is, this is our life, however many days God's given us. And for those in the room who've met Jesus, there's a, there's a moment, it might be a date, I mean, you might know the date you met Jesus, you gave your life to Jesus. Some of us did so when we were a child, some of us when we were in our 40s, some of us might come to know Jesus on our deathbed. All of us have a story and it's, the story is what God's been doing in our, in our life. This is before I met Jesus. This is what happened when I met Jesus. This is the circumstances and experiences and how God led me and drew me to himself. And then, and then this is what has happened since I've met Jesus. And last week we talked about our senses change and our identity changes when we come to know Jesus. Actually, everything changes when we come to know Jesus. And today we're looking at Nicodemus, and you're like, there's a part two to Nicodemus. We saw him in John chapter three. And let me sum up John chapter three where we were and read the final few verses of the text that we were in. This might be a familiar text to you. John chapter three, verse 16 was originally, first time it was ever spoken was one-on-one. -on -one. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And if you're a guest here today, if you stumbled into church, this is for you today. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that, who, that if you believe in him, him being Jesus, should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus doesn't condemn you, but all of us were born into sin. Our sin condemns us. We're all separated from God. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. Verse 21, this is important to remember in the context of Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. This will come up later. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. That's the end of the conversation as far as we know. Nicodemus walks away. Jesus is gracious. He's gentle. He's honest. He's kind. But he's also truthful. He tells Nicodemus, apart from me, you're condemned. No matter how good you've been, no matter how many the 660 plus rules and laws you've kept, you're still separated, you're still condemned. Your sin has, has condemned you. And then we don't hear about Nicodemus until John chapter seven, he shows up again. So John chapter seven, turn there. I have you turn to John seven, verses 45 through 52. John is writing, verse 45. Now, after Jesus had just spoken, he had said some controversial things. The rulers, the religious leaders, the Pharisees are gathered up. This is where we pick up. John 7, verse 45. The officers then came to the chief priests 
and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him? Meaning, why didn't, why didn't you arrest him? The officers answered, no one has ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, have you, have you all been deceived? Are you out of your minds? Are you crazy? That's my paraphrase. Have, have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Listen, he's speaking some things. He should not be allowed to be saying these things in public. We should arrest him. And this is where our friend Nick shows up. In verse 50. Nicodemus. Now, just to be clear, this is the same Nicodemus. Now, John makes that clear. He, he's doing something as he's writing this book. He's, he wants the reader to know this is not just another guy named Nicodemus. This is the same Nicodemus who went to Jesus before. Nicodemus, verse 50, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, does our, law, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? He's, let's be fair. Let's be reasonable. Let's be logical here. Let's not rush to judgment. This is the first time Nicodemus identifies with Jesus. Was he born again at this point? I don't know. We can ask him someday. At some point, was, right? This is John 3 here. John 7, I don't know. Is John 7 before he gives his life or is it right after? I don't know. But obviously God's doing something in Nicodemus. God has been patient with Nicodemus. The end of the story was not when Nicodemus walked away in John chapter 3. If you have a friend, son, daughter, if you have been praying for them, just because they've said no at one point does not mean God is done with them. God is still pursuing them. Be patient with them as Jesus was patient with Nicodemus. There is something stirring in Nicodemus. This is no longer private. Now he's making a statement publicly. Okay. Do you see the difference? Do you see the change? First conversation, minimal risk. At night, alone, nobody sees me. It's safe. What harm is there? I've just got a few questions. Minimal risk. If you have a friend in your life who's open to ask some questions, meet with them, listen to them. They're what we would call a person of peace. They're here, but they're open to the gospel. Have coffee with them. You consider them a good friend. They're, they're hanging around you. They're watching you from a distance. They're exploring what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus. Nicodemus was watching Jesus from a distance. First conversation, minimal risk. John chapter 7, moderate risk. Right? Now, now it's public. Now his peers, now he's stepping forward and making some statements with his peers. His peers are watching. How difficult is that? Right? To say I'm a follower of Jesus in a public high school. I can do it in church. It's minimal risk. Can I take that step and now can I share this with my coworkers? M moderate risk. John chapter 7. First time Nicodemus identifies with Jesus. And they replied, are you from Galilee? Are you from the same place Jesus is? Nothing good comes from Galilee. This is Jerusalem. This is Judea. Remember, there's men of wealth and influence and power. You're not from Galilee. Nicodemus, you with, you with this guy? Are you siding with this guy? Nothing good comes from Galilee. Actually, they were so focused on condemning Jesus that they weren't even honest and truthful. They had forgotten their history. When, when emotions run high, logic runs low. I learned that when I was raising kids in our home. <laughs> Maybe you can relate. Here they are, pretty angry, pretty upset. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Actually, Elijah came from Galilee. Jonah came from Galilee. There's belief that Nahum came from Galilee. But they were so focused. Nicodemus, his first time that he's identified with Jesus. Now, a couple of things, when we, we, we can view this passage of scripture and the work that God's doing in Nicodemus' life. I can view that as a mirror into my own life. And some of you, you're looking at this, my, your own life. Times where you've, before Jesus, 
when you met Jesus and what God's been doing since you met Jesus. There's also that we can view this as a window into as we lead other people to know Jesus. Now, sometimes the ministry program song that was important to me when I met Jesus, right? And for those of us followers of Jesus in the room, we can think of that day where we gave our life to Jesus and it was this great program at this church. We loved this local church. It was a song. And what we can do is we can project that passion, that love for whatever it was that God used to save us. We can project that onto somebody else. And I just caution on that. There's a little warning, caution, because God works on everybody differently because we're all very different people. And so that's why some of us, right, we come to know Jesus as a child. Some of us, it's later in life. But let's be careful we don't make it about that ministry or that program. Programs, ministries, churches come and go. Jesus saves. That program didn't, didn't save you. Jesus is the one who saves. And also be careful that we don't compare someone in chapter 7 with someone else in chapter 3 to someone else in chapter 19 that we're going to look at in just a moment. We're all at different places. Listen, I'm 50. God's been really, really patient with me. I don't have it all figured out. God's been patient with me. I don't have all the answers. There's some things he's been patient and tender with me to arrive at, and now I have some strong convictions. That did not happen at 18. It did not happen at 25. It didn't happen at 45. And my prayer is by 55, you know, I'm a, I'm a little closer to Jesus. Right here is, let me write this down here. This is Jesus Jr., Right? What do I mean by that? Let me teach you a word. It's a church word. It's a big word. One of those $5 words. Sanctification. It's a biblical concept. What does that mean? It means every day, right, the, by God's grace, I'm becoming more like Jesus. That tomorrow, everyone in the room, that we've moved a little closer to Jesus. We've moved from John 3. We moved to chapter 7 with his patience and by his grace, right? So sanctification means until I no longer have breath, Jesus is working on, he's working. And for me, a lot of work to make me more look like Jesus every day. That's not complete until after I'm gone and I'm on the other side, okay? So we're all in the process of what we would call sanctification. Some of us, we haven't met Jesus yet, and that's the most important next step for you, is to meet Jesus. And last week we talked about, look at Jesus, and you'll be saved. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to come to church 50 time, 52 times a year. You don't have to go to every small group. You don't have, you're, you're saved by looking at Jesus. He's done the work for you. After we meet Jesus, now we're taking steps to follow him and get to know him better, to love relationship. I, uh, I'm taking risks. Nicodemus moved from a minimal risk. Now he's moderate risk, John chapter 7. It's your story. And when the, all this is put together, you have a story. And I challenged you last week to begin writing and thinking about your story. And at the end of all of our stories, it's to be continued. Because the story is not over yet. God is not done with you yet. He's not done with me. And so every week as we go through this series in the month of November, we're hearing a testimony. And today, I'd like to have you turn your attention to the screen as we hear from Marta, and we hear Marta's story. God intervenes even when you don't see him, even when you don't feel it, he is there. He is there. I grew up in a small town, and I was always taught from my parents about charity. They were philanthropists. They, they did uh, for many people. And I, then I grew up to become a nurse, and I did give myself to Christ when I was 17 years old. My brother and I went to a church, and we both got saved, and he passed away suddenly he had cancer and I turned my back on God I was mad at him I couldn't understand how somebody who had such a calling could have been taken away from us he was such a stabilizing factor in our lives 
So it took about 40 years, and along the way, I developed um, epilepsy as a child, and I didn't know that I had it. And as I got older, I started having more and more seizures, and then the doctors gave me more and more medications to help counteract those seizures. It didn't help, and I lost myself. I was spiritually poor, mentally poor, emotionally poor. There were all those things, and I kept getting farther and farther away from God. And until about three years ago, I had decided to take a cleanse, and when the cleanse was over, it incapacitated me to the point where I couldn't respond to the doctors and tell them, oh, I took a cleanse. They told me that they would be discharging me to a nursing home for the rest of my life. My brother-in-law and my sister, Paula, came to my rescue. They said, you know, you're not gonna spend the rest of your life in a nursing home. We're gonna move you to Arizona with us. I've been here for three years and Paula and I drove around the neighborhood. We looked at things and she saw a sign for Boulder Mountain Church. She said, you know, I think we need to go there. And we automatically felt welcomed and, and it felt comfortable for us that the sermons really resonated with us. And then right after that, I had an appointment at the doctor's office and a girl came up to me and said, God sent me over to you to pray for you. I said, me? You're praying for me? She said, yes, God sent me to you. She was healed from a brain tumor previously from someone praying for her and she wanted to pray for me. A month later, I had my last seizure and I'm down to six pills a day instead of 22. And I'm completely off the mood stabilizer and I started the Celebrate Recovery. I didn't know what to expect really, but CR is a 12-step program that helps you with hurts, hang-ups, and habits that develop from those hurts. You know, I, that's what I was struggling with the most was like these feelings, mixed emotions. What am I going to do with all these things that are now coming to the surface? But I stuck with it, and I have to attribute that to God too because He made a way for me to get there every single week. I look back on all of this now and I think how God rescued me from my hole. I was in the deepest, darkest hole there ever was. And it progressed very slowly, but each time I look back, I see where he saved me. And um, I've just grown closer and closer to God over the last year. Jesus means everything to me. He is my savior. He took me out of the hole. He rescued me, and he wants me to tell the story. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah, there were some really grateful for Marta. It takes courage to share your story in front of the whole church. So Marta, thank you for that. There were a few statements. I don't know if you heard them, if you caught them. 40 years. She went 40 years. Felt like God was distant. But God's not distant, right? Just because we can't hear God doesn't mean he's not present. Just because we can't see him doesn't mean he's not present. 40 years. God intervenes. She pointed to the testimony of Jesus saving Marta now drives. There were a number of things that she didn't share in the test in her, in her story. There's so many life, so many life changes happening in Marta's life. Celebrate Recovery is one of those. Here at Boulder Mountain, we've had a step study for men, step study for women happening all of this year. Nine long months of doing hard work to work on hurts, habits, and hangups. And there's only two types of people in the world: there are those in recovery and those in denial. Because we all have hurts. We've, we've, we're all broken. There's all, all of us have things we need to work on. I was grateful for, for Marta sharing her story. We're in the middle of Nicodemus' story. And we, now we move to John chapter 19. And John 19, you can turn there, is the passion text. It's the chapter where we see the death of Jesus. You're like, how's Nicodemus going to show up in that, 
in that story. John chapter 19, verses 38 through 42. After these things, this is after the death of Christ. So throughout the, the Gospel of John, the hour is really important. Before we read the passage, the hour, the time is near. Uh, the hour has not come yet. And last week we talked about being born again. We talked about when the hour has come. It means when the woman's about to go into labor, the hour, it's time, right? If you're around a pregnant woman, she says it's time. You, you know what's happening. And Jesus said the hour has not yet come. It's not yet my time. The hour is not, well, the hour has come. And when Jesus refers to the hour, he's talking about his death. The hour has come, and now he has died. And what happens immediately after his death? John 19, verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, also a Pharisee, part of the Sanhedrin, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might be taken away, the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, there's our friend Nicodemus. Is this minimal risk, moderate risk, extreme risk? This is extreme risk. This is not just public. This is siding with the criminal who's just been executed. And the Roman government would often leave them on the cross for days, for their body to be decayed, and for everyone passing by to look and see what happens to those who cause trouble to the Roman government. But it was prophesied hundreds of years before that Jesus would not decay. His body would not decay on the cross. And that prophecy was written so that Joseph and Nicodemus could serve Jesus in this manner. Now, typically, the death, especially the death of a criminal, taking the body would be reserved for women and slaves. This is the, the cultural context here. If Joseph and Nicodemus wanted to do this, they very easily, they had the wealth and the money and the power to hire someone to do this. That would have been less risky. But Joseph and Nicodemus do it themselves. And they ask for the body. And what would this entail? This would entail them removing Jesus from the cross. We've seen a lot of passion plays and we've heard a lot about Jesus being placed on the cross. We haven't heard a whole lot about what would it look like to remove hands and feet and remove those railroad spikes from the cross. How much effort and strength and power for that to have happened. If you thought about that, Joseph and Nicodemus did that. They were wealthy. They, I, I think of their garments getting dirty and, and bloody, removing the body. And Jewish law there were a number of things that would have made them unclean. Now remember, they're Pharisees. They're breaking the law. They're becoming unclean by touching a dead body. On a holiday. That didn't, that didn't stop them. And so in order to take the body, they would have had to examine. And, and for a proper burial of a, of a dead individual, proper burial would have removed would have required them to remove all foreign substances from that body. So they would have examined his entire body and found broken pieces of thorn all over his head. They saw his bloodied, matted hair, the terrible bruising of the face, the areas of beard pulled out, the dry and the cracked lips. They turned the body over to see his shoulders and arms are riddled with splinters, each one of them having to be removed with care for proper burial. The back from the shoulders down was a bloody open wound from the terrible scourging suffered before the crucifixion. His hands and feet were smashed and bloodied. On the front, just before the rib cage, there was a gaping wound made from the spear thrust that confirmed his death. Again, the psalmist writes hundreds of years before that no bone would be broken on the body of Jesus. And there was a Roman soldier's job to would go to each criminal and confirm the death to make sure that this individual was dead. And they would take a club and they would break the bones, the leg bones, to make sure if they were still alive that those bones would be broken and asphyxiation would, would occur. 
Worst of all, it were the eyes that did not open, the eyes that Jesus looked at face to face in John chapter 3, one-on-one conversation, the eyes and the, the voice that did not speak. That, that Nicodemus here is fulfilling prophecy. Now, Jesus, because he's Jesus and because he's God, and John writes all about that Jesus is the Son of God, when he took his last breath, after he died, he could have resurrected immediately. He, he, as soon as he died, he could have, boom, before everybody dispersed and went away, he could, have, he could have defeated death in that moment. Why did he wait three days? There's a few things. Number one, there's prophecy. There's a lot of prophecy being fulfilled. But also, it's so that in his ultimate humanness, he would experience death, and he would experience the burial process as all of us will experience. He in great humility, for I am crucified with Christ. I have been buried with Christ. It's what baptism is. We are buried with Jesus. If he was never buried, it'd be hard to be buried with Jesus. Jesus was buried. He didn't stay in a tomb. Now, this is really interesting. Joseph Nicodemus, his tomb of Joseph. He had a tomb. Wealthy individuals had a tomb reserved for themselves and their family. It wasn't a used tomb that most criminals would be taken and, and placed into a used tomb with other criminals and other, after the body decayed, they take the bones, place it in a box, there'd be all these boxes in a, in a used tomb. This is the first time this tomb has ever been used. Otherwise, the Pharisees would, would say, well, his bones touched the body of another prophet and that's how he defeated death. But he's placed into a, a tomb that's never been used before, but it's borrowed. Jesus doesn't need a permanent tomb. It's just a borrowed tomb. There's also work that he's doing as he's in the tomb. But in Isaiah 53, verse 9, it says the Messiah would be with the rich at his death. Hundreds of years before, God is aware of Nicodemus and aware of the work of Nicodemus. In Mark, in this passage, Mark writes about this passage and says that Joseph and Nicodemus boldly asked for the body, not just boldly asked for the body, very boldly asked Pilate for the body. When have you been very bold for Jesus? It might have been the most masculine thing Nicodemus ever did in his life was to very boldly go ask for the body of Jesus. But it's also, I believe when you read this text, I believe it's one of the most tender things Nicodemus ever did in his life. At the very same moment, he's bold and confident and he's tender with great care. The question Nicodemus asked Jesus, let's go back to that in John chapter three, it was, how is one saved? And Nicodemus is thinking from the perspective, if I'm saved by works, right? if I'm saved by works, listen, if you and I are saved by works, one of two things happens. Either I'm really confident in who I am and all the laws and look how good I am and I'm condescending to everybody else, but I'm not humble. Or if I realize that I don't measure up to all the laws and rules and standards that I've set for everybody, including myself, then I might be humble, but I'm not confident. But if I'm saved by grace, as Jesus says, we are saved by grace, not of works. There's, I can't be proud about it. But what the gospel does, what the true gospel does, is it brings us into the dust of the earth. And then it rises us up to the skies. There is, you can be humble and you can be confident at the very same time as a follower of Jesus. You can be bold and confident and you can also be humble. How does that happen? You see that in the case of Nicodemus. Very boldly asking for the body of Christ. With great, with great care. To be bold and to be confident. This burial gave both Joseph and Nicodemus a way to proclaim their relationship with Jesus. There was important work for Jesus to, to do while he was in the tomb. Jesus is buried with us in the humiliation of utter humanness, and we are buried with him. Now, what are, one of the, what are some of the characteristics of someone who comes, comes to know Jesus? What happens? There's changed life. There's fruit. And what that looks like, right? 
it's different for all of us, but there's, there's changed life for Nicodemus. It meant he was going to show up and care for the, Jesus. Now I'm thinking, where are his followers? Where are his 12 disciples? Where are the ones who followed him for three years? Where'd they go? You would think they would have been the ones caring for the body. But it's no, it's the one who Jesus has been so patient with and was so caring and so tender, who's been watching Jesus from a distance. He's now the one who shows up. Now this is a decision of high risk. It's important to note that there are those of us in the room, we're in John 3. We're in chapter 3. Some of us are in chapter 7. We're learning about what it means to be first identified with Jesus for the very first time. And some of us are taking high risk for Jesus. Where, where are you at? Are you in chapter 3, 7, or 19? As a church, our mission is we make disciples. And what, is, what does a disciple mean? You hear that word? What does a disciple mean? And here, here's the definition I would give you. It's an all-in follower of Jesus. An all-in follower of Jesus. Are you a disciple of Jesus? If not, what is your next step? What is God calling you to do? What's the next step? Is it, is it here? Is it the cross? To give your life to him? If that's happened already, what's your next step? Is it to move to the next chapter of your life? Now, this sanctification process I talked about earlier, I would love if all of us could experience getting to know Jesus up and to the right like this. That'd be great, wouldn't it? If tomorrow I'm just more like Jesus than I was today and the next day I'm more like Jesus. It's this beautiful growth pattern and chart, right? Has anybody in the room experienced this? Because I haven't. And if you have, I would love to meet with you and find out your secret sauce. But <laughs> even though I want to get to know, be more like Jesus tomorrow more so than today, here's the reality of what it more often looks like as we go throughout our life. And I want you to know this, and I believe this was true in the life of Nicodemus. There's highs, and there's lows. And there's maybe a small high and a big low. And then maybe there's a, there's a high. And then, may, you know what? Maybe I go backwards. And I thought I, already, I thought I already dealt with that issue, and it keeps coming back up. But by God's grace, right, over time, this is super messy. It's super messy. But by God's grace, the sanctification, God is at work in all of us. And by his grace, we're taking steps. We're taking steps every day toward Jesus. What's the step he's asking you to take today? Have you ever identified with Jesus? Are you in the, I just, I want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone. I want to explore more. This is a safe place to do so. Nick at night, for when we hear that title, most of us thought it was Nick at night in John chapter 3. But Nick at night is actually when he came to take the body away and it was dark out. He met Jesus twice in the night. Where are you at? Where are you at in the sanctification process? A changed life. C.S. Lewis has a book called Mere Christianity and that book was written based on radio talks that C.S. Lewis gave. They took those talks and they put them in a book. And this is what he said at this very last radio talk. He says, how scary it is to let God come in and change us. Give up yourself and you will find yourself. Lose your life and you will save it. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ, my friends, and you will find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. Look to Jesus. Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have been so patient with all of us. And it's your desire that all of us would come to know Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. And that's, for some of us, that's really scary. I'm sure it was for Nicodemus. Father, I pray that you would make clear to us in these next few moments what our next step is toward you. What, is it, what does it look like? Holy Spirit, make that really clear to us. Give us the wisdom to know what to do and then give us the courage to do it as you gave Nicodemus the great courage 
to show up when everybody else ran away. Thank you for this picture of a changed life, of a story, of a testimony. That was his story. Now God, do a work on our story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm so glad that you joined us for today's service. Let me leave you with a few next steps that you can take. Number one, let us know that you're participating online. You can make a comment there in the notes. You can send me an email or you can give the church a call. Just let us know. We'd love to add you to our email list that updates our people on what is happening in the life of the church. Number two, if there's something I can specifically be praying for you about, I can give that prayer request. I will pray for you, but I can also give that to our prayer team. A third next step that you can take, if you've been encouraged by the ministry of Boulder Mountain, even though you've maybe never been here physically, uh, let me encourage you to give. We believe that giving teaches us contentment. When we recognize that God's been generous to us, so at Boulder Mountain, we give first, we save second, then we live on the rest. So there's an opportunity for you to participate in giving through our church website. If there's anything else that I can be doing for you or, or Boulder Mountain can do for you by sending you resources, simply let us know. Otherwise, let me pray for you as we close our service. And so for those, Father, who are not here in the room, we recognize church is not a building we come and sit in. So wherever they are at, we know and we believe that, Jesus, you are with them. So I pray that they would sense your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, give them the wisdom to know what to do and then give them the courage to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you this week.